And uh, you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to be in verses 44 and 46 this morning. But open your Bible. If you don't have one, should be one right in front of you in the chair. And I think it's on page 1041 of uh, the Bible there. So today is our seventh installment of the parables of Jesus. Um, one of the things that we've seen uh, in this series is how Jesus uses the ordinary, everyday objects of, uh, of life to teach his disciples. Common things like wheat and weeds and mustard seeds and yeast and, and planting a field and making bread. I mean, just ordinary things. Today he continues that as he uses a fishing net and different types of fish. The seven parables of Jesus uh, in Matthew 13 tell us the, the full sweep of the kingdom of God. Together they, they tell us how the kingdom begins, how it grows, and the obstacles to growth, and how much we should value the kingdom. One of the interesting things that Jesus has done in, in telling the parables is that, that he has told twins of one another here in this chapter, just with, with slight differences. The growth and the influence of the kingdom is told in, in the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven. One depicts visible growth and the other depicts invisible growth. The preciousness and the value of the kingdom is, is told in the parable of the hidden treasure and the, and the parable of the pearl of great value. One illustrates the, the, value, of the, uh, the value of the kingdom to, to one who accidentally finds it. The other illustrates the value to the kingdom of one seeking it. Jesus also taught two parables depicting the present mixture and the future separation of the kingdom. The first was the parable of the weeds that we covered a couple of weeks ago. The second one is today's, the parable of the net. And there are some subtle differences between them. If you remember, the parable of the weeds was a hard one for the disciples. It was the only one that they asked him to explain. It's probably a hard one for many of us to understand, too. The, ter the parable talks about how the kingdom will grow and evil will coexist with good in the world. It will be allowed to grow that way, at least for a time. The idea that we must coexist with weeds and their destructive influences is not a great thought, is it? It's a little, it's a little bit disheartening. But I'm sure that Jesus recognized that, and, and that's why he comes full circle. And he kind of ends with this particular parable in this chapter, this, this section. He wants us to have perspective. The kingdom will start small, but it will grow, visibly and invisibly. It's the most valuable thing people could ever possess, whether they're looking for it or not. There will be weeds among us as the kingdom grows, and they will try to imitate us, and, they, and we will be forced to, to endure their presence. But one day we will come to the kingdom at the end of the age. And the parable of the net tells us how the wicked will be separated from the righteous and punished for their sin. And that's today's parable, so let's look at Matthew chapter 13, 47 through 50. These are the words of Jesus. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate, separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Of all of Jesus' parables, I'm sure this is the one that they could have related to the most. Most of the guys here, most of the disciples, had backgrounds in fishing. Many of them had left their nets when, when he called them, saying, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So this one would have had special meaning to them. They would have known about the net that Jesus referred to. They would have understood the whole process of, of fishing and, and what it involved. And there's, and there, there's important uh, 
uh, details to understand in this parable that involve fishing. So the fishing, there, there are probably a few here that believe since two-thirds of the earth is covered in water that we should spend two-thirds of our time fishing. I think Nate might be one of those. There was a time when I tried my best to live that way, but of course that was before I had kids. <clears throat> but many of Jesus' Jesus's disciples had lived that way. They had lived that way. So they were very familiar with all the imagery this story would have brought to mind. Many would have pictured themselves back on the Sea of Galilee. There were three basic methods of fishing there, and, and all three are still used today. Savannah, you want to go to the first slide? <clears throat> the first one is a hook and a line. This is the one most of us are familiar with. Sitting on the bank of the river, just gently floating in a boat, baiting your hook and, and casting it out into the water. I know, I know George just did this a couple weeks ago, right, on the river. Catching one fish at a time, just nice, lazy day. That's the kind of fishing Jesus told Peter to do when they needed money uh, to, to pay the two drachma tax in Matthew chapter 17. The other two involve nets. You want to go to the next slide. The first is a cast net. It's called a cast net. And these circular nets are anywhere from 4 to 12 feet in diameter. They have weights going around the perimeter. It was used by one man who would wade into the shallow water and he'd look for schools of fish. And when they were close enough, he would, he would throw the net while holding the cord. And the net would open up in the air, and it would fall down, land on top of that group of fish. The weights would, would make it sink, trap those fish, and then he would, he would pull on that cord and would draw that, that net up like a sack. Then he'd, all, he'd haul that catch up to the shore. This is what Peter and his brother Andrew were doing when Jesus called them uh, to follow him in, in Matthew chapter 4. The other net, Savannah, you want to go to the next one? The other net was a very large net called a, a syene, or a drag net. These are so large that they require a team of fishermen working together. It was often strung between two boats out in deeper water. And they would work together to slowly, slowly spread this, this net out, and then they would slowly work to come together till they formed a giant circle. Or else they would, they would pull it together toward, toward the shore. Floats were attached to the top of the net and weights at the bottom. This formed a, a wall of a net from surface to, to the bottom of the lake, making it almost impossible for, for anything to escape. Because of this, all sorts of things besides the desired fish could get caught. It swept up everything in its path, weeds and trash and and all manner of sea life, sea snakes and turtles and crabs and lobsters and, and fish of every kind. When the net was filled, it would take a, many men, a team, just to drag it into the boats or onto the beach. Then they would sit and sort the good fish from the bad ones. And the good ones went to market, the others were thrown away. This was the type of net Jesus told Simon Peter and the others to let down after their unsuccessful night of fishing. And they caught so many, it almost swamped their boats, and they had to call for help to pull it in. So, so they would have understood the image of the net from this parable when Jesus spoke. They would have recognized other things about fishing, too. The water. The water wasn't always clear. Maybe by, by the shore, right up on shore, maybe you could see into it. Maybe you could see the bottom. But once you got into it, the water would, be, would become a bit dark. Brackish, even. Most of our lakes are like that, with a, a few exceptions. I mean, Gull Lake. Gull Lake is exceptionally clear. Maybe, maybe some of the oceans, if you go into the Caribbean, you know, the Bahamas, you know, the water is very clear there. But, but most of our lakes, most of our seas have sediment and, and things in the water that darken it. A lot of times you don't see what you're catching until it comes to the surface. 
Now, maybe an experienced fisherman may, may know based on how the fish fights. But usually the water is dark and, and you can't really see what's going on there. And then storms. Most every fisherman understands how quickly the weather can change, right? You can be out on the lake calm as can be and then suddenly, suddenly a big storm blows in. The sky is dark and the winds pick up. The water gets rough. Pretty soon you, pretty soon you find yourself holding on for dear life as, as you try to make it to the safety of the shore. Storms can come quickly and unexpectedly. And then gear and equipment. When you're fishing, you're always tending to your gear and your equipment. You need to take care of it. Nets need to be mended. Lines need to be checked. Boats maintained and repaired and buoys and bobbers and pliers and, and all kinds of things. They all need to be tended to and, and kept in proper working order. But even then, even then, things are bound to happen. Lines snap, especially when you got the big one on, right? Where the boat springs a leak and the net gets snagged and lines get tangled. Some days it's, it's just a battle and you don't even catch a thing. I would say that Jesus painted a, a very good picture of what the growing kingdom could be like. Not everyone would receive it. It would start out small, but it would grow. The most valuable thing anyone could find. There would be lots of fakes mixed in. Growing God's kingdom here on earth would not always be easy. The world we are to evangelize will often be murky, and dark. Storms will come and they will batter us. But we must take care of our gear and work with others. This parable reveals what God is doing among people today. And more importantly, what he will do in the future. This parable shows us the gospel of the, of the kingdom involves two things. Two things. An invitation and a separation. The sea in the parable represents all lost humanity. It's a sea of despair and hopelessness. The deep, dark abyss of iniquity and evil of every kind. The net is the church, extending the gospel invitation. This day of grace, God is using us. He is using us to throw out the gospel invitation. Now, I'm glad that I live in a day of grace, where I could be so freely saved. And now I can, I can invite others to be freely saved as well. May we never get tired of casting the net, giving the, giving the invitation to believe, to witnessing to others that are in the sea. So we're going to look at the invitation. The invitation, there, there are two parts to the invitation. The first thing Jesus points out is the casting of the net. The casting of the net. Before anything else can happen, the net must be cast into the sea. The word must go forth into the world. It must be heard. It must be received. This is the first part of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19. Go. Go, therefore, and make disciples. If you're going to make disciples, you have to go. Disciples generally don't come to you. Jesus' disciples didn't come to him. He went, and he called them. We must go, and we must cast the net into the sea. Hebrews 10, 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him, in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to know unless somebody goes and tells them? This means that we must go out into the world and proclaim the good news of the gospel. The invitation must be made. The net must be cast. 
So that there can be the gathering, which is the next point, the gathering. Jesus said that the net was thrown into the sea, and when it was full, it gathered fish of every kind. Fish of every kind. The gospel is available to the entire sea of humanity. People of every kind. Nobody is so high that the net cannot reach them. Nobody is so low the net cannot descend to them. None are so small that the net cannot embrace them. None, none so big that the net cannot surround them. None are hopelessly lost. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. 1 Timothy 2.4, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Thank God for all. Amen? Two of the most beautiful words in the Bible are everyone who. Everyone who. Acts 2.21. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Or whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever. The rich and the famous and the down and out. The religious Nicodemus needed to be born again and so did the thief on the cross. Our mission statement. The whole word to the whole world. We are to cast the net over the whole world. The young and the old and black and white, rich and poor, Republican and yes, even Democrat. Democrat. The next part of verse 19 for the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Of all nations. There's a story about William Colgate, the the founder of of Colgate Pomalev. I'm sure many of you probably have some of his products or from the products from his, his company in your house. He was a Christian and his church was having an evangelistic campaign. They were praying for souls to be saved and for the church to be, to be built and to grow. At one meeting, a prostitute came forward and confessed her sins. She wept openly, asking God to save her soul, to change her life. She also asked if she could join their church. See, churches at that time would vote on members. They would vote on someone becoming a member. The preacher hesitated to call a motion. The silence was pretty uncomfortable. Finally, someone voiced a little opposition and said, well, maybe, you know, maybe we should just wait on that right now. And at that point, Mr. Colgate arose and said with just just a touch of sarcasm, I guess we blundered when we prayed that the Lord would save sinners. We forgot to specify what kind. We'd better ask him to forgive us for this oversight. The Holy Spirit has touched this woman and made her repentant, but apparently the Lord doesn't understand she isn't the type that we want him to rescue. The congregation got the point and the woman was unanimously received into the congregation. The invitation is for anyone, everyone who, whosoever, the world. Oftentimes we, we judge on who we think deserves to hear the gospel. Who we're willing to go tell the gospel. Well, I'll go here and I'll go there. I won't go there. I'm not going to tell them. It's for everyone. It's for the world. And just like fishing, sometimes it's a bit messy. Jack Hiles is an evangelist well known for his innovation using bus ministry. He he revolutionized 
bus ministry in the church. In 1961, he wanted to start this at his church at First Baptist in Hammond, Indiana, not too far from here. But when he brought it up, he was met with criticism from a deacon in the church. And the, the deacon said, well, preacher, this, this new idea of a bunch of kids in church whose parents don't come, well, well I, I don't like it. I don't like it. Jack said, well, brother, this, this idea isn't new. D.L. Moody was bringing in hundreds of kids 100 years ago in our area in Chicago. Yeah, but all those buses sitting out in our parking lot is not going to look good. Jack replied, well, Moody brought them in in wagons and lined out in front of the church. Man said, well, but don't you know the mess of oil those buses are going to leave behind? Jack's response sums up how messy casting wide net can be perfectly. Yes, but Moody's wagons were horse-drawn. Don't you know that they left a mess too? Yes, the world may be dark, brackish and messy and stinky. We may encounter all kinds of setbacks and difficulties. Storms may come and, and threaten to swamp us. Our tackle and our gear may break. We may face persecution, financial difficulties, all kinds of discouragement that, that makes us want to give up, that may cause us not to even want to leave the safety of the shore. But we must go out and fish. We must go out and fish. Despite the problems that come as you reach out to all kinds, we are to be a church that casts a big net for every kind. It's the only chance they have to be caught up in the net. The invitation involves casting and gathering of every kind. Just like the parable of the weeds, there will be those who are fake. The enemy will trick people with a false gospel. False teachers that peddle a, a God and a religion of their own making. They, there will be those that come in and pretend to be one of us. Just come to enjoy some of the benefits. They may even fool themselves into believing it. But at the end of the age, there will be a separating. The parable of the weeds spoke of coexisting for a time, the real and the fake. This parable reaches out into the future when they are separated. In this parable, Jesus shows us three things about that separating. First, it will be final. Verse 49, so it will be. So it will be. No loopholes. No way out. Now it's too late. The devil has convinced many people there's no hell. Some he's even convinced that there's no heaven. Savannah, do you want to do the next slide? There's a, a new Gallup survey that just came out. It shows the decline in spiritual beliefs in America. And it's a little hard to read there, but I'll summarize it here for you. If you go from 2001 when they started to 2023, the, the latest results. Belief in God. In 2001 was 90%. 90% of people surveyed believed in God. Now, 74%. 2001, 79% of people believed in angels. That's dropped to 69%. It's a little odd because you think about the first one, God, it's a 16% decline and there's only a 10% decline in angels. So, hmm. Heaven. In 2001, 83% of people believed in heaven. 2023, that's fallen... 16% to 67%. 2001, 71% of people believed in hell. 2023, that's dropped to 59%. The devil, 2001, 68% of people believed in the devil, and that's dropped to 58%. Those are some really sad statistics. They explain a lot about our world, don't they? People don't believe in God anymore as much as they used to. 
They don't believe in the devil. But they believe in angels. They believe in the things that they want to believe in. But the, be- the, the devil's best tool that he whis- whispers is, is not that there's no heaven or no hell. But there's no hurry. There's no hurry to make a choice. That's really what he does. But on this day in our text, so it will be. So it will be. That's declarative. The end is coming. It's time that we warn our loved ones and even complete strangers because whether they believe it or not, time is very short. I believe that. I believe the time is very, very short before the Lord returns. Then there will be no more chances and no more hope for them. Acts 17, 30-31, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. For He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising Him from the dead. On that day, it will be final. And it will be factual. God won't make any mistakes. He knows who is saved and who is not. The angels will come out and will separate the evil from the righteous. Someday, a great sorting will take place. And it, and it won't be good people going to heaven and, and, and bad people to hell. It's not how it's going to be. That's how everyone thinks it's going to be. Well, I'm a good person. No, it's not going to be based upon that. It's going to be wheat and tares. The saved and the lost. There will be sheep and there will be goats. The just and the unjust. When the books are open, the record will be clear. Romans 14, 10 through 12. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give account of himself to God. They will be separated based upon God's record keeping. God's record keeping. Not theirs, and certainly not ours either. Some may have reason to doubt their salvation. They may have the preacher fooled. They may have the church fooled, their family fooled. They may even have themselves fooled. But they cannot fool God. Some, some will be saved out of, out of apostate churches that don't preach the gospel. There will be some Catholics and some Protestants that, who in spite of their salvation by works teaching, will be saved. In spite of belonging to one of those churches. Those who have opened their Bibles for themselves, seek the Lord, hear His voice, and believe. There will be those that have sat inside good churches where the gospel has been faithfully preached, but they never received it. Weeds that rode in on mom or dad's or grandma's or grandpa's coattails, but they, but they never really submitted themselves, their hearts to God. Notice that it is God and his angels who make the final determination. It's been said that when we get to heaven, We will be surprised by some of the people who are there and surprised by some some who are not. We don't judge who are truly believers. Only God knows. This is warning against the false confidence of those who may be in the church but who do not truly believe. It's an urgent call for each person to examine their heart. Test their faith. To see if it's true, as Paul said. 
Have you truly repented of your sin and put your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation? There is no sliding scale. You're either in or you're out. God doesn't judge on the curve. He doesn't weigh the good you did against the bad that you did. Either you're in or you're out. The only way is, is, is in is through faith in Jesus Christ and His shed blood. That is the only way in. Are you washed in the blood? Are you washed in the blood? Don't fool yourself into thinking that you could be good enough. Because when that day comes, it will be final. It will be factual. And it will be fatal. Jesus says the angels will will separate the evil from the righteous. Then he says they, they will throw the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's the same Im- image we saw in the parable of the weeds where, where they're thrown and burned. It's a picture of, of everlasting pain, mourning and regret. Find the same picture in Revelation chapter 20, 14 through 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, we don't like thinking about the final judgment. But we must listen to Jesus' words and the warnings of Scripture. We must. The teachings about judgment in Scripture are essential. They are essential to our faith. If there is no judgment, then there is no need for salvation. If there is no final judgment, then that means that evil gets away with wickedness. If there's no final judgment, then there's no moral reckoning. And that would mean that we live in an unjust world. But God's kingdom is a kingdom of justice. And so, yes, there is a day of judgment coming. Jesus' teaching from the parable of the net is clear. At the end of the age, angels will separate their wicked from the righteous. They will throw the wicked into the fiery furnace and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I know many today are saying that God would never send somebody to hell. It's called universalism. It's, a, it's actually a thing. People say, well, God would never do that. God is too loving. In the end, he'll, he'll relent. God would never send someone to hell. My response is, I agree. I agree. God doesn't send them. They send themselves when they reject the get out of, free, uh, get out of jail free card that is offered to them through Jesus Christ. They send themselves to hell when they reject that free gift that is offered to them. They have a chance at parole and they reject it. I realize many would go a step further and say, well, you know what? I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in hell. But I say Jesus did. Jesus did. And now it's your word against his. So, it's not a place that anyone wants to go to either. Some may joke about it and say, well, well, heaven doesn't want me and hell's afraid I'm going to take over. Right? Or, or they'll say, well, I'm already living hell on earth, so what's the difference? They have no idea how wrong they are. Even as they, as they try to describe their pain or the difficulty of their life, they minimize the reality inadvertently, not even realizing what they're doing. Hell is not living with bad memories or struggling through life uh, with, with all its pain. It's not a place where, where people keep, keep sinning. It's not a place where sinners keep, get to go and just keep sinning. Unrestrained. It's not a party. There is no pleasure at 
all, at all in hell. Not even the perverted pleasure of sin, only its punishment. That is the only thing that is found in hell. Punishment. The human mind cannot even begin to conceive of the eternal horror that is hell. Even the the biblical descriptions only give give us a glimpse, just a glimpse into it. First, hell is is a place of constant torment, misery, and pain. No relief ever, ever, ever. Scripture like Matthew 22, 13 described the torment as utter darkness. Utter darkness. Where no light can penetrate and nothing can be seen. Throughout eternity, the damned will never see light again. They will never see light again or anything that light illuminates. Which makes sense because God is the source of light and He removes his benevolent presence from hell. Mark 9.43 describes its torment as a fire that will never go out and cannot be extinguished. It's an everlasting fire that will never go out. Utter darkness. Second, hell will involve torment of both body and soul. Neither are ever annihilated at death. And never will be. After the judgment seat of Christ, everyone receives a resurrected body. Everyone receives a resurrected body. Those in Christ will enjoy the glories of heaven for eternity. Unbelievers, unbelievers will endure the torments of hell forever. Physically, Mark 9.48, Jesus describes hell as a place where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The resurrected bodies of unbelievers will never be consumed. And the hellish worms that feed on them will never die either. Spiritually, they are forever removed from the benevolent presence of God. Don't think that the devil is afraid that you're going to take over from him. Because he will not be in charge there. That is his punishment too. Many people have this idea that that God reigns in heaven and Satan reigns in hell. No. No. Hell is his punishment too. One day... Jesus will cast the great serpent and his demons into the lake of fire. They will receive their judgment and their punishment too. So Satan is not concerned about you taking over hell. God is the one that oversees hell. God is the one that oversees hell. It is a place that he removes the side of God that we like. We like, we like to talk about God's mercy, His grace, His, His forgiveness, and His love. But we forget about His righteous anger, His wrath, and His vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He will remove the former, and He will only give the latter. The soul will be forever crushed knowing that it will never again be able to experience God's kindness or goodness. Never experience God's kindness or goodness. Never experience His mercy or His grace. Only His judgment and His scorn. There is a physical and spiritual torment that never ends. And that's the the final horrifying reality of hell. The torment of hell will be eternal. Nothing will be so horrible about hell as its endlessness. Jesus uses the same word to describe the duration of heaven and hell. Matthew 25, 46. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So here's the thing. Everyone will have eternal life. 
They will live forever. Some will live for eternity in God's glory. Others will live in His eternal punishment. The people of hell will endure the torment and they will experience it with absolutely no hope. No hope. It will never end. No matter how difficult the tragedies of your life here on earth, they will never come close to the true horrors of hell. This parable is a warning. It's a call to all who hear not to ignore or reject the call of Christ, but to enter God's kingdom while you still can. While you still can. Yes, God allows evil and sin to continue in the world for now. But the final judgment is coming when God will judge all evil and sin, and those outside of God's kingdom will be punished for their sins. We don't like the judgment passages of Scripture because they remind us that we're accountable to God for our sin, for our choices, for for our actions. And, And we don't want to be accountable to anyone. We may not like these passages, but they're an essential part of Scripture. Judgment is coming whether we like it or not. But God in His goodness warns us about that coming judgment. He tells us how to escape it through Jesus, his son. Jesus is coming again, amen? And when he comes, this world will end. God's great dragnet will sweep through the earth and none will escape. All people, great and small, will stand before the throne and be judged according to their works. The punishment for sin will be serious and severe. Those who reject Jesus will experience eternal pain, mourning, and regret. Only those whose names are written in Lamb's book of life will be saved. And so now, now is the time for you to make your decision about Jesus. Now is the time to make your decision about Jesus. It will be too late after you die or after Jesus returns. There are no second chances. Now is the time for salvation. When Jesus returns, that will be a time for judgment. Because God will make the division then, you must make your decision now. Have you trusted Jesus for salvation? Have you trusted Jesus for salvation? If not, I urge you, I encourage you, I invite you, I welcome you, I beg you. Come to Jesus today. Come to Jesus today. He loves you. He died for you. He is waiting for you. What are you waiting for? One day Jesus will draw in his net. And then he and his angels will separate the righteous from the evil. The saved from the lost. Will you be in or will you be out? Will you be one that is saved? Or will you be one that is thrown into the fiery furnace? Don't leave here today till you make that decision while you still can. If you know that you're in, then what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you fishing? Are you fishing? Are you being part of the net, the fabric, to gather others into the kingdom? Are you working as part of the team to bring in that great net? Pray that we would be faithful to do all that we can to draw others to Christ while there's still time. While there's still time. What an opportunity we have this week as we bring in all of these children, new children, new families that have never been here before. What are their stories? What are their backgrounds? Have they been in a church before? 
Do they know about Jesus? Have they ever accepted him as Savior? We have a tremendous opportunity to cast the net into the sea, to draw others to Christ, to tell them the good news that they can be saved. They don't have to face eternal punishment. They don't have to face God's wrath. They can receive God's mercy and love and forgiveness and His eternal joy as they spend eternity with Him. May we be faithful this week This week, we have an opportunity to cast that net. Are you on the team? Are you on the team to help draw in that net? I pray that you are. In whatever way you are able, pray, work, come alongside these children. And then Thursday night, when these children put on this concert... After they work all week and they practice and they work hard and we pour into them, they stand up on that stage and they they let that come back out to their their families, their their moms and their dads and their grandmas and their grandpas and their their, their aunts and their uncles and their brothers and their, their sisters. May they also receive the gospel. May we go out and cast the net there too. Not just sit and watch the show and then clap at the end. Woo! We're still working. The sea is there for us to go into. May we be faithful. May we be faithful. If we believe, if you believe, you say you believe what this says, the end is coming. The end is coming, and it is coming soon. And when it comes, it will be too late. And those that are out will face eternal damnation. Do you believe that? Then how dare you sit idly by and let them go? May we be faithful. May we be faithful. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you again, and Father, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these lessons that you have given us. As you show us your kingdom and how it will end one day here on earth, and at that time, there will be a separating. There will be those that are in and there will be those that are out. Those that are in will will go into eternal glory and those that are out will go to eternal torment. Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, I ask you, and Holy Spirit, may you empower us to be faithful, to be on the team, fishermen, to cast that net, to go out into the sea and to draw others to you before it's too late. Pray that this week, even this week, that we would be faithful, that you will use us, and that your great net will catch many for the kingdom. Father, we look forward to all that you will accomplish this week in, through, for us, and for your kingdom, the lives of others. We give you praise for this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. Amen. Turn to 774 and let's stand together as we close.
called up yonder will you be there will you be there I pray that you are amen amen now it is our responsibility to go out to share the good news the gospel message with the world so that they can be there someday as well amen let us go